Okay, so uh, this was supposed to be Andre giving his talk on uh, uh, whatever he would have liked to talk about, but uh, he uh, had to stay in Italy for family matters, and uh, so he was he trusted me in deliver delivering this talk on our joint work. He could have actually given me the slides for just to read, but he said that he uh, he trusts me so. Uh, all responsibility for you no know, wrong claims and, uh, and uh, wild conjectures uh, is mine. And uh, Andre is available by Skype if you need to ask questions. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so uh, well, it's a bit tough to give talk on, on this topic because uh, even on uh, by physical stand by by standards of physics. M theory is not uh, uh, defined. Uh, we know that uh, this is uh, some quant this is uh, this is a quantum theory which uh, looks like. Eleven dimensional supergravity uh, at low energies and we know that it contains uh, extended objects uh, which are 2 plus 1 dimensional and 5 plus 1 dimensional. So what does it mean that it contains extended objects? 11-dimensional uh, uh, supergravity has uh, solutions of, so these are basically solutions of uh, supersymmetric version of Einstein equations, which have singularities along uh, some three-dimensional surfaces in 11-dimensional Super manifold, 11, actually 11 slash 32 super manifold. And uh, it, so there are solutions which have singularities uh, along some three dimensional surfaces or six dimensional surfaces. Uh, and uh, the belief is that these singularities are actually a reflection at the lower energy physics of some fundamental objects which have to be added uh, into the theory to make it uh, fully consistent. So um, in the absence of the actual definition of the theory, it seems impossible to, to even talk about it. Nevertheless, uh, since we believe uh, that this is a, there, is a, there is supersymmetry involved, there are some questions which uh, can be asked and probably answered without detailed knowledge of the fundamental definition of the theory. This is, uh, should be compared to the questions in uh, uh, no, topology, which you can ask, uh, and so you can answer uh, without knowing, for example, exact metric on the manifold. So you can compute cohomology groups of a manifold without uh, knowing the precise geometry of the manifold. So here, the goal would be to define something like the cohomology groups, which would be associated with some backgrounds in M theory, uh, which we could compute and get some idea of what, what are the actual degrees of freedom of this theory. So uh, naively, what would you expect from the theory, which, which is a quantum theory of, uh, which, can, uh, which likes to live in 11 dimensions and contains uh, gravity, not only supergravity, but just gravity. Well, you would think that to a 10-dimensional manifold, so for, for the moment, let me forget about the supersymmetric aspects of the theory, just uh, think about uh, ordinary geometries. So to a 10-dimensional manifold, you would associate some space of states. This 
is like what you just heard at the previous talk, where the topological quantum field theory to uh, to co-dimension one uh, manifolds or topological manifolds in topological field theory, you associate the space of states, uh, and to each now in this case 11-dimensional manifold whose boundary is M10, you would associate a vector in this space. Now what this space of states should look like if uh, it's supposed to describe the 11-dimensional supergravity? Well, this should be some space of functionals or maybe line bundle valued functionals on the space of metrics on M10. Uh, and now, uh, let me just tell you something about 11 dimensional supergravity. In addition to uh, uh, metrics, uh, it also describes uh, the three forms. So you would have to add to your functionals. So the arguments of your functionals would be the metrics, three forms, and uh, Since it's the supergravity, there will be also some odd fields, and these odd fields are the sections of the uh, Rarita Schwinger spin bundle. So these are, um, in terms of representation theory of spin group, this is something like the tensor product of the uh, vector representation and the spin representation quotient by by the spin representation. So uh, in f throughout, throughout the talk, I will use the notations where V is the 10 dimensional representation of, of uh, the group spin 10, the group of uh, rotations in the spin cover of the group of rotations in 10 dimensions, and uh, S plus minus um, are 16 dimensional, uh, two 16 dimensional spin representations. So these representations are constructed, if I didn't make a mistake. So if you choose a complex structure on V, if you identify it as a, or more precisely, if you identify the complexification of V with a direct sum of a five-dimensional vector space and it's uh, dual, then the spin representations would be either the odd or even algebra of the space W twisted by the square root of the uh, top of the determinant line. And so, uh, what do you think if you get three out of 10? Well, uh, you should, okay, so it's, it, it, it goes th through here actually, so you should act with some uh, supersymmetry generators which are uh, spinners and they transform the metric which is a symmetric two tensor. So one vector in the symmetric two tensor becomes a spinner, another remains the vector. And if you act the second time, you, you have various options but one of the options is to transform this vec vector into a spinner and then you find three forms in the, in the tensor product of spinner representation. It's a, you can actually, it's an, it's an interesting exercise to understand why do you need three forms and not two forms or five forms. You need to count the number of components in, uh, well, just basically the, well, it's a little bit, just a little bit too tri uh, trickier than just the, the, the dimensions of these representations. You have to decompose them with respect to the so-called little group, which is actually spin nine. So symmetry group of, of uh, massless fields in, in 11 dimensions. And you would see that if you want to match the dimension of the corresponding representation of the little group for odd variables and the uh, corresponding dimension for even variables, if you know that you have here this, the symmetric, so this is uh, symmetric uh, tensors, and here you have this uh, Rarita Schwinger fields, um, then you would need to, to, the miracle is that you can actually 
supplement is by some tensor, which is the anti-symmetric reform. In, that only works in the lambda function. Oh, I didn't say that. No. I didn't say that, but uh, you could translate that to, to, it, to, to, to the language as well, yes. This, this comes from just from, uh, this is web basic representation theory of, of spin map. So, uh, so very naively, what one should look like, or should look for are the, uh, so the functionals on the space, which are invariant under the action of, well, first of all, diffeomorphisms of M10, and then, uh, well, then additional, some additional symmetries Morphism, which, which actually elevate, which, which uh, reflect the invariance of the theory under the 11 dimensional diffeomorphisms, namely what, you, what you're aiming for is to be invariant under various choices, under the different choices of this 10 uh, dimensional slice in 11 dimensional manifold. So, so these additional symmetries have to do with these invariances. Then you have uh, the gauge symmetries of the three form. Uh, so this, so if C belongs here, then you have symmetries which shift in three form by, by an exact form. So, so these symmetries are generated by two forms. B is a two form in turn defined up to a closed two form. So B And then there are odd symmetries. So the symmetries which shift, uh, uh, this act on, on, on this part. So it's a pretty complicated space, uh, unlikely to have a, any, a nice structure. Uh, however, and well, I mean, if, if, if it were possible to describe this, describe this space in, in any practical terms, then it should have been possible to do it in uh, you know, in, in, in four space time dimensions, which where you, you, you would be dealing with three dimensional metrics, which are under much better control. Um, however, so, so today we, what we will be trying to do, we will be trying to describe some sort of, uh, we would like to endow this space with a structure of a complex, and we will be computing the Euler characteristics of this complex. So this, so this is, so the space of functionals is actually complex. I'm sorry. Thank you. So H is a complex if, uh, if M10 is non-compact. and has a special holonomy. Well, for the purposes of today's talk, the special holonomy would be uh, a holonomy SU5. So that means that the holonomy preserves uh, a spinner. There is a covariant constant, constant spinner. And that, mean, that means that uh, out of uh, this local, so there are local uh, out of local fermionic symmetries in, this, in a situation where you uh, actually have some boundary conditions of infinity which you want to preserve, there is a global fermionic uh, symmetry which is actually a differential, so it's, it squares to zero. So global and M is then a Calabia of five manifold.
when we ask physicists whether what they mean by the 10 dimensional, 11 dimensional theory, they say, well, this is only with global energy. So we do not actually believe that there exists a, a quantum field theory which is described by Lagrangian and past physics. Uh, that we will not be able to be defined at a level. Uh, right. uh, so in the, because of this, what do, do we expect that this Hilbert space actually exists? And there is something wrong I don't actually say it was a Hilbert space. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, I believe that, so you see, so I'm now describing uh, a situation where my 10 manifold is, is non compact and therefore very large. So this is uh, a substitute for the low energy, for the words low energy. So this, this is why. We can try, in this case, we can try to describe the theory as, as 11 dimensional supergravity plus something which will add, add uh, term by term. So the difficulty with M theory at the fundamental level is that these extended objects have to be treated at the f in a fully you know, random fashion. So they can be, have to be small, there is no control over the topology, let alone geometry, and uh, there is no practical way to, to enumerate them all. But if, if your geometry is very large, so then approximately it is uh, a solution of Einstein equations with some additional structure, and then the contribution of these extended objects is small because they, they uh, well, once we arrange things properly, they will have to be also very large, therefore very heavy, and so they will contribute something which will be suppressed. So, um, a priori, it, it is not guaranteed to work. So the way, and, and, and then that it will work, it's, it, well, it was a surprise and a miracle and sort of a, a, the hint that actually things do, so the hint that, that actually this thing exists because it's, it's not guaranteed. So <laughs> maybe I should, make this part of the story shorter and then go to the mathematically better defined story. I can just jump actually to the, to the part where you know, everything can be explained to school children. Should I? Okay. So, okay. So, um, anyway, so, so it turns out that in the case where you work on the non-compact manifolds, which are asymptotically Calabi-Yau five-folds, this space of functionals on, that, on this horrible space actually has a fermionic symmetry. So it has, a, has a, there is an odd, there is an odd vector field which acts there, which squares to zero. And in this case, uh, maybe we cannot understand this, this space itself to all detail, but what we can understand are the fixed points and cohomology. And uh, again, this, uh, these are sometimes called the BPS states. So, so this is again the BPS story of the earlier talk, except that now we are more ambitious. Instead of working in two complex dimensions, which is what I did in the morning, we're now trying to do something in five complex dimensions. But in fact, it, it will turn out that uh, the problem of uh, enumerating all BP, the BPS states on the Calabi L5 fold will actually, uh, we will, will be able to formulate it in one of the two equivalent ways, either as, uh, as a problem in two complex dimensions or as a problem in three complex dimensions. So, there are, there are, so the Z5 sometimes can, be, can project to, to two uh, interesting complex varieties, and you have two ways of uh, enumerating the cohomology of Q, the two-dimensional and three-dimensional. And two-dimensional way will actually, in many respects, uh, be the way which I talked about in, in the morning. So this is the morning version, sometimes. And so I want to talk about the three-dimensional way of looking at things. Okay. 
One additional ingredient which will make uh, the story a little bit more informative than it might appear at first sight is that uh, I will assume that my collabial fivefold has a symmetry. So it's a, it's an, this is an additional assumption. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> so two plus three is five, and this is eleven minus one over two. All of the all of this is uh, is quite important. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So actually, well, I'll assume that Z five is toric, and so there is a torus. So. A priori, there is a five-dimensional torus which acts there, but there is a <coughs> four-dimensional subtorus which preserves preserves a holomorphic top-degree form, so the collabial structure. And it is so it is this this subtorus which will actually commute with the action of this uh, odd vector field Q, and uh, it will allow us to classify, so, so this Hilbert space, I said Hilbert, but I, well, I didn't, the space of states will actually split, first of all, it splits is, is an odd, and even an odd parts, and then each of these guys will decompose into the representations of of, of this torus T, and I mean this is this, this is a this is a highly infinite sum, uh, but uh, we will be interested in the index, and so the index, so the index, say again, I'm oh, sorry, yes, so the index. Uh, of M theory on on Z5, by definition, would be the it would be the difference of uh, the difference of these characters uh, for the e even and odd ones. Um, I mean, you could think about about difference of vector spaces, so or you can think about actual characters. It doesn't matter. So I want to compute this. This is what I want to compute. Well, we want to define this and to compute it. Okay. So there are two ways of uh, looking at this problem. One historical one and one they may be more logical. So um, logically it's probably better to start with Euclidean space. So the simplest Calabia of five manifold possible. And then so you have the action of the so the torus uh, uh, C star to the five acts uh, by just, just multiply uh, the coordinates separately by, by phases. And uh, so there is a subtorus where the parameters Q multiply to one which is, uh, so this is my, my torus T. So this is the torus which preserves the, uh, the top degree form. Yes, uh, okay, yes, that's a good question. Actually, um, yes, 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 uh, actually, oh, I erased. When I said about functionals on the, on the supermanifold, uh, when you actually work the work out the details, 
they look like spinners on, uh, some, in, on some infinite dimensional space. And so you have spinners of positive and negative chirality. It's, uh, you see, at level of fields, we have grading. Uh, so the, the metric and the three form has grading plus, and the, and the, the Rarita Schwinger field has grading minus. And so this grading somehow translates to the space of state. Again, on the compact manifold, this may not be true, actually. And, uh, and so this structure will be lost, most likely, on the, on the compact 10 manifold. So they are functions of this field. So, it's like, for example, it's work that's plus and change the thing minus. This should be a tensor process. Whatever. This field is directly transferred to the tensor. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, it's a... Uh, yeah, how should I say? Well, it's just grading. You want to keep it, but you're creating something else. Well, it's a grading, yes. It's, uh, but it has to... Do, it's a chirality. Uh, but it's not, it's not, it's chirality, not in the sense of the space-time rotation group. I'm saying that, so think about now this infinite dimensional manifold of metrics, modular diffeomorphisms. So on, on that space, you have, you, you, you have to define a spin structure. And so the, sp the spinners on that manifold are their functionals on the supermanifold, which I described. It's uh, maybe... Yes. If, if, uh, yeah, if you take an elementary field, like uh, you take a, uh, some component of the, of the fermion of the radar Schwinger field, it, and act with it on, this, on the space of states, it will map H plus to H minus and vice versa. And so, and so this operator Q. So Q is also composed out of Rita Schwinger and, and some bosonic fields. And so it maps one to another. Okay. Uh, it, globally not, but uh, we will, I mean, we will describe it in, a, in sort of in the neighborhood of a fixed point of the T-action on C5, and then it will be a kind of a Fox space built out of all uh, modes of the, of uh, the metric, of the graviton field, and the three form, and so on and so forth. So, so, it, so locally it will look like a, a huge symmetric algebra tensor, some uh, wedge uh, uh, exterior algebra. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so start with this with the with Euclidean space with the action of the torus, which preserves the, the, the phi form, and now let's just describe locally what is the metric. So it's a two, it's a uh, it's a symmetric two tensor, but it's also it also depends on on on, uh, on where you are in R10. And normally in uh, you know in textbooks on quantum field theory, we are instructed to expand. So we actually we usually usually what we write we write this as uh, the Minkowski metric plus the small small perturbation, and then we we usually expand these perturbations in the Fourier, Fourier basis. We do a Fourier transform because uh, typically the symmetry of quantum field theory is, uh, is a, is a, contains translations. And so the Fourier modes are eigen, eigenfunctions of translations. Uh, so this is what is usually done. Today, we, we, we want to work equivalently with respect to rotation. Rotations break translational invariance. So plane waves will not be a good uh, basis and uh, Actually, uh, the, the most naive basis, namely the Taylor series, turns out to be more appropriate. So if I split my coordinates into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic ones, then, well, I just get a bunch of uh, tensors So my, so my space of fields, as far as the metric is concerned, will be, is just the Fox space built on, on, built on, the, on, the, on these uh, numerous Taylor modes of the, uh, of the graviton. 
And the same, do the same for the Gravitina. So this is Rolita Schwinger. Also known as Gravitino. And uh, for the three form, and then you just count. You just count the uh, so so this component corresponds to the I corresponds to the eigen uh, to corresponds to the particular character of my torus, which is uh, Q i to the power alpha i minus beta i bar. And I just need to count them. And so what will I get when I count them all? Because it's a Fox space, I will get, uh, I will get an infinite product. And so, uh, well, uh, I should write it as a statistic form. where f actually turns out to be a pretty simple function. Plus uh, it's conjugate. This is, all, and remember, we have a condition that the pr product of Q is equal to one. So what this function is, actually, this is a character of the space of uh, holomorphic vector fields on C5. So somehow, we may not know all the details of the of the definition of the theory, but we know there are, it, it somehow likes holomorphic vector fields. Well, this is not the end of the story. Uh, it turns out, and this is historically how it, it actually came up, uh, that you can rearrange this, this generating function. Now let me do the five equals, equals three plus two trick. So I want to, we write this in the in the in the fashion which is not symmetric with respect to the natural symmetries, namely the vial symmetry of uh, SU5. So I want to introduce another variable. Um, let me call it K. The it's 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 a weight of the uh, holomorphic uh, three form on the three dimensional. So I want to decompose C5 as C3 cross C2. There are many ways of doing this, of course. So I, I just picked, picked some, some decomposition. And then uh, let me introduce P, which is Q4 uh, times the K to the one half. It turns out that this partition function can be rewritten in terms of now Q and P. In fact, expand it, and expand, uh, we can expand it in the powers of P. Well, first of all, what is non-trivial non is that it, it actually has a, has a limit when P goes to zero. In, in, in this formula, you have Qs and Q inverse. It's uh, a priori, it's not guaranteed that uh, you can actually send some of these Qs to zero, uh, but with this definition, actually, it turns out that you can. And um, so there is something which is not interesting, which I will call index zero. And then there is a sum, p to the n, mu n. So this is some rational function. And uh, 
what this mu n is. It's the sum over all plane partitions of size n. So, uh, you imagine the corner of the room, you stack boxes at the corner of the room, you, uh, you, you st stack precisely n boxes in the in in optimal way so that you cannot move them closer. I'm sorry, I don't have patience for drawing this properly. And then each uh, configuration of boxes, each plane partition has a weight uh, which uh, has the form. So where W's are some uh, monomials in Q1, Q2, and Q3, uh, whose precise, uh, so what are these monomials is uh, read off the shape of this partition. And here I also have four variables. So, uh, so I didn't do anything. I just, I just expanded. I, I just re-expanded this partition function near uh, the locus where one of the weights of my torus section was actually approaching zero, and the other was, uh, some, some other was approaching infinity. Uh, so, what this weight is actually? This is. Uh, this is an index of its own. It's the um, so this mu n, which is a sum over all plane partitions of fixed size. This is actually an index. So it's it's now T three equivariant. So T3 would be the uh, torus spanned by the first three C stars. Index of Dirac operator. Now it's this ordinary Dirac operator. Q3. Q3. Only three. No, no. Qs are coordinates, are coordinates on the torus. So T, my T is now, it can be written as a T, it's T3 cross C star up to something discrete. So Q, T3 is spanned by Q1, Q2, and Q3, and C star is spanned by P. Okay, Coordinate eyes. <laughs> so these are the. So, so I take the. I, I, I'm rotating the first three coordinates, and then compensating by by uh, by. Uh, uh, by rotating the, the fourth and the fifth in the same fashion by, by multiplying by k to the inverse uh, one half. Uh, and then the remaining symmetry is the symmetry which acts on the fourth and the fifth coordinate with the, uh, with the opposite weights. And so that's what um, singles out C3. Okay, so but so what is this? So this is actually the T3 equivariant index of Dirac operator, in other words, the A Wolf genus, which is Singer was talking about yesterday, of uh, of, a, of a space which uh, 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 Joseph Bernstein talked about yesterday, almost talked about yesterday. It's a space of it's a, well, it's a Hilbert scheme of endpoints on C3. So uh, it's a space of triples of commuting matrices, but properly defined. So this is a space of uh, 
so these are matrices uh, n by n. And we, we study them up to GLN, uh, simultaneous GLN conjugation. And there is some stability condition that there is a cyclic vector which, uh, which generates the and the Marshall vector space where they act. Uh, this is a highly singular space. And uh, in fact, it should be viewed as a zero dimensional space. So it looks like, it looks like a partial compactification of the nth symmetric power of C3. So it looks like it has dimension 3n. But in fact, we should really uh, view this as a, a space uh, with a so-called it's a space with so-called perfect abstraction theory. So each point, um, how should I think about it? So, so this is, so. No. It has many components of different dimensions. And, and, but uh, we should view this nevertheless as a sort of virtually zero dimensional space because it's a, it's a critical locus of a functional which is trace. And so you might think that if you perturb this function, somehow you will get uh, transversal uh, intersection. So uh, you'll get isolated critical points, and so then you will just get some number of points. Um, now, in general, if you have a space which, uh, which is sort of, which is embedded in a smooth ambient space with some uh, equations which may be not transverse, you can define virtual, uh, it's virtual tangent space as the uh, tangent space to the ambient space minus the, uh, the tangent space to the space where the equations take values. And in this case, when the, the, the space is, is, is defined by the, uh, by the equations uh, that this is, a, this is a critical locus of some function, the local model of the space is uh, a zero section of some manifold into in, in its contingent bundle. And so uh, in the circumstances, so the tangent, the virtual tangent space is the difference of the tangent and the cotangent, actually, because that's where, this is where the equations so S being dW in this case, uh, take values. And so you can define the virtual A roof genus or A roof genus of this virtual uh, tangent bundle as the ratio of A roof So, uh, well, now if you introduce the virtual uh, churn roots of the of the tangent uh, tangent bundle, then this would look like uh, the ratio of where k accounts for the uh, torus weight of the canonical bundle. So you see, these are not, uh, we, we're talking about the T equivariant A roof genus, so even though the uh, churn characters, churn, um, the, uh, the, the virtual churn characters are exactly opposite as, uh, as cohomology classes, but they are not exactly opposite as, as equivalent cohomology classes. And so there is a K is a, so K accounts for the weight of the uh, canonical line bundle, which is uh, Q1, Q2, Q3 in this case. And so this is uh, essentially the explanation of, of this formula. Historically, it was derived that way around. So we, uh, we were interested in the moduli spaces of um, torsion-free shifts on three-dimensional varieties. 
and trying to define the, uh, the partition functions uh, similar to what I discussed in the morning and uh, discovered to our surprise that when you compute this partition function and sum over all uh, churn classes, now this time n actually plays the role of the third churn character of, uh, of an ideal shift in this case, then uh, suddenly you get a, a function which has more symmetries than you are naively expected. So naively you are counting shifts on a three-dimensional variety, so you would expect a symmetry of permutation of, of these weights. But then when you include the, the generating parameter which counts the, uh, which accounts for the topology of your shifts, you get an enhanced symmetry which exchanges, which, uh, exchanges the symmetry uh, of grazing type with the symmetry of equivariant type. The fixed partitions, partitions are fixed points of the. These are monodic right So I'm, I'm skipping. Uh, well, uh, now the the work which which we are doing now uh, mostly concerns trying to extend this. Well, for, there are two aspects of that. So, of course. Uh, so the Hilbert scheme of endpoints is uh, uh, so it's a modular space of uh, ideal shifts uh, whose topology is uh, topology is uh, well very simple. So you, they only have non-trivial channel three. Now, if you work on the more complicated uh, uh, manifolds, so you may have a toric toric Calabiao or you may have a toric threefold, uh, which has non-trivial uh, H2. So AY3, more general. So it is still toric, so there is an action for the three-dimensional torus. Uh, so if H2, of A3 is not zero, we, uh, we normally consider shifts which have uh, non-trivial co-dimension two components. So we study uh, torsion-free shifts with chan two. And um, again, so there is a localization with respect to the action of the torus, but now when you look at the, uh, the way the, the fixed points of this, on the, uh, the, the, the shifts which are in, invariant on the action of the torus look like, they, uh, they have this structure where near each fixed point of the action of the torus on Y3 itself, they look like these plane partitions, except that they're now allowed to go these boxes, these stacks of boxes are allowed to go to infinity. And uh, they go to infinity with some fixed cross section. So the cross section now is a two dimensional par ordinary partition. And uh, so these are the fixed points of the action of the torus on the Hilbert scheme of points on C2, which is the normal bundle to a divisor in Y3. So uh, you, get a, you, well, you get a combinatorial problem where you have to sum over all partitions uh, on the compact edges, on the finite size edges in the toric diagram. Um, so if you have something which goes, to, goes, goes off to infinity, then they, they're not allowed to, to extend there. And uh, there is a similar, there is a similar uh, formula for the uh, fixed point contribution. And um, so, well, so you get eventually, so you get out of this some function of, uh, uh, so we would, okay, so it looks like it's some index which is, which is associated with Y3 and it depends on Q1, Q2, Q3, and P. So he, Y does not have to be a Calabial. So Y is not a Calabial. But then it turns out 
if, well, and we've checked this. Uh, we, we, unfortunately, this computation this is very quickly becomes pretty formidable. So we've checked it, this up to degree four. Uh, for uh, for several y, so but well, this is this is represented. This is this is called the conifold. So this is, um, or you know, some more generally, it's a it's a vector bundle over p one. So this is a good example. So what we've checked is that you can actually lift. So after you you got this partitionality function, and you you can rewrite this as something which is associated to the five fold. Which is uh, which will be a two rank two vector bundle on top of this y, such that the total space is a collabial. and then uh, you have different ways of uh, as I erased, you have different ways of cutting now multiplicatively cutting your fivefold as a product of three dimensional and two dimensional, and uh, you get the same the same result in this respectively of the of this cutting. So it suggests that there is something which is intrinsically five dimensional. And the challenge is to uh, to produce some intrinsic uh, theory of uh, holomorphic curves in five-dimensional Calabi Yaus, which would uh, uh, give the same uh, generating functions. It is definitely not the gromov witten theory. gromov witten theory in five dimensions is trivial because the the dimension, virtual dimension of the modular space of curves is negative, actually. So, uh, it's three, three is the maximal dimension where you have something interesting. Uh, it is not, uh, it is, it seems, to, it's not a theory of uh, shifts because then uh, the, the resolvent has length five, so you have, uh, so the equation, you see here in three dimensions, you have three equations and one relation between these equations. So you are barely okay. So you have, you already have something non-geometric, namely, the you know, x3, which pops up, but it cancels x, x0. In dimension five, you don't get such a cancellation. So it is not, it should not be a theory of, uh, of uh, shifts. It should be, it should be a theory which somehow has to, has to uh, for, for which the symmetry has to be holomorphic vector field. So it has to be more, ge more geometric and intrinsic for, for, for the manifold itself. So, uh, I didn't cover the whole story, and I didn't, well, I maybe didn't explain uh, all the details, but that's the flavor of what, of what excites us at the moment. It's a, it's a, it's actually uh, what's interesting is that if if your torus T three preserves the Calabi-Yau structure, Calabi structure, so that k is equal to one, then this weight cancels, and then you get just the usual count of uh, plane partitions uh, with mac machen function as the as the, as the result. But it turns out that if you refine the mac machen function, you get this uh, five-dimensional structure. Which sort of uh, bypasses the old ca contradiction that uh, there is no four-dimensional analog of Mike Mahan, and so you have to go directly to five. Yeah. Other questions? Well, if no questions, let's <laughs> uh, Our conference goes to the end. <laughs> and we have to finish with several speeches. First of all, let me give uh, uh, the ability to say something from uh, organization or program committee. Organization. Uh, well, uh, Vladimir Retak, please. Ладно, говорите так. Okay, uh, so that. Okay, 
Uh, so this I will speak on behalf of the organizing uh, committee. So first of all, that's a good day to finish our conference because uh, Israel Gelfand was born exactly 100 years ago. So that's uh, this one. Um, so we hope that this uh, conference reflects actually Gelfand's approach to mathematics with its breadth and with the, his belief that, uh, the, the, to the, um, that mathematics is, is just uh, his belief to the unity of mathematics. Uh, and uh, so we tried to organize this in the spirit of Gelfand's seminar, except we, we didn't provide the speakers with a lot of interruptions. So, uh, right. And yeah, well, Okay, so then, of course, so we have to, to thank uh, all speakers and uh, also Gelfand's uh, students and collaborators who uh, shared their memories about his mathematics, about his uh, life, and um, so on. Uh, we also have to thank uh, members of Gelfand's family who were with us, and then uh, uh, to thank sponsors, uh, first of all, MIT, who actually just gave us this room and, the, and actually provided us with the secretarial support. Well, Jen and Shirley are not here, but so thanks. And also the conference had support from uh, Harvard or Rutgers, that uh, NSF, uh, Clay Institute, then the Rosenbaum Foundation and Madge Goldman. We have to thank our sound technician. Well, that's, the sound is good, I hope. All right, now the conference is videotaped, so all speakers signed uh, so the release, so, and we will post. All mistakes are videotaped. Yeah, it's okay. And we will, so we are going to post this on Rutgers website, and there will be uh, references to this on the website of Clay uh, Institute. Again, thank to MIT Video Services. Uh, not uh, all uh, organizers were here, so Simon Gindikin had some health problems, and uh, well, very unfortunately, Andrei Zelovinsky is not anymore with us. And uh, so the last but not least, uh, thanks to all participants. Well, Let me add to... No, no, no. Uh, in opposite, uh, no, no, sorry, not on behalf of organization committee, but on behalf, I think, on behalf of all participants, uh, let me say it, uh, several sentences. First of all, I think the level of this conference and the level of the talk was uh, maybe more than the National uh, Congress. Uh, usual. <laughs> Secondly, I want to say that my impression, I don't know, it's very difficult to check, that Israel Moisej, if he can be here, was very glad to see this mathematics, uh, to he uh, hear about uh, his ideas, and to uh, mm, uh, uh, gratitude to all uh, uh, organization committee and to, to us. Uh, and I'm sure that this is very uh, nice and very important meeting. Thank you very much, f uh, first of all, to Pasha, whose energy was enormous, to Volodya, and to all other whom you can uh, mention. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you to all, and I want to uh, invite all of you to Gelfand's uh, 200th anniversary, which we will hold here at MIT. Thank you. <laughs>